Welcome back to the Wildlife Garden Project. Today I'm here with Ellie and Ben from the Wildlife Garden Podcast. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, who are also, they're also organic wildlife gardeners. Who That's your day job, isn't it? Yeah, yep, that is. Every day. Day, in, day <laughs> out. And then the podcast you, you do in your spare time, don't yeah. you? Yep, yep. Plus month's holiday, really. Yeah, <laughs> you know, hobby is gardening and gardening for work. Gardening 24 7. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so today we're going to be talking to Ellie and Ben, and they're going to be giving us some hints and tips on how to do wildlife gardening in small spaces. So if you've got a very small garden or a yarden, or even if you've got just a balcony, hopefully you're going to learn something today. So. Tell me about your garden. How big is your garden to start off with? Well, I actually had to measure it just today. Right. Because we didn't really know. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it's six metres by just three and a half metres. Yeah. So it's very wee. Um, but we feel like we've crammed absolutely as much as we possibly can into it. So yeah. we're very proud. We also rent it as well. Right. So we had to be careful with that in terms of what we, uh, what we could and couldn't do. Mm. So um, yeah, we're proud of it though. I want to talk to you about planning. So if people have got a, just a newly acquired a garden or they've just got a garden that they want to turn into a wildlife garden, what would you recommend to people in terms of planning? I think the most important thing, like with any garden, is to know where the sun is and where the shade is, any damp bits, any really cold bits, because that's going to inform the plants that you can grow well in each area of your garden. But for us, we just planned the layout, didn't we? Because we wanted, we knew we needed somewhere to sit. So we sort of planned the borders around that um, and then watched to see what the sun was doing and things like that. So I think it is an important thing to do, definitely. Yeah, take into consideration what you're wanting the, the garden to do for you because mm. you want it to be fantastic for wildlife. But if you need somewhere to play football, you're going to need a lawn. But if you don't need that, then you could have something else, a pond instead, say. Um, so it's about deciding how you're going to use it. Are you going to sit out there and have your morning coffee, in which case, where is the morning sun? Mm. Or are you going to have your meals out there in the evening, in which case, where's the evening sun? And that changes throughout the year. So mm. it's really important to get a good idea of where you stand before you actually start putting plants in the ground. Mm. Yeah, it also allows you, if you've got an overall plan to aim for, to maybe build your garden over a really long period of time. Not everyone has lots of time or money to do that, you know, sort of grand designs type thing. So certainly with this, like we, we built like the planter first because we got some sleepers to do that with. Mm. And then we sort of added bits in as we got the materials that we could do it. But we always had that final plan in our minds to sort of aim for mm. which I do recommend doing it that way as well it really yeah. helps having a plan but then being adaptable depending on what you can acquire for free or, or what might pop up on its own that you didn't exactly. know yeah, that's that really kind of important yeah. yeah always look and see what you've got already as well yeah if you can they say the good advice is just to watch your garden for a year and that's hard to do. You can hold yourself back. You can, yeah. <laughs> For the first year, if you just want to sow some manuals into a pot, that will give you something to do. But yeah, if you can just sit and watch the first year, you get to see what insects are coming in. Because things like um, at the mining bees, hmm. you might find you've got a mining bee colony in your garden, which you wouldn't know until you sat and watched it. And you, you'll see the telltale vo volcanoes in the spring. Um, but you don't know that when it's winter and you're first starting, you know. So you, you need to give it time to find what's already using your garden. Hmm. So how is the planning of a small wildlife garden different to planning a larger garden? What kind of things do people need to bear in mind? I don't think there's that much difference. Mm. I mean, we did do a little scale drawing, but mm. really it was the back of the fag packet type. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was very basic, but it was enough. Um, I think if you've got a bigger garden, you've got more opportunity to do a bigger range of things mm. on a bigger scale, obviously. So when you've got a smaller garden, it's important to realise you can't do everything. You can't fit everything in. Mm. Everyone wants a meadow, a pond, a tree. Yeah. Uh, you you kind of have to pick and choose what, what would work best in your space. But another tip we would give is also, if you can, go up to the top floor of your house and look around, see what your neighbours are doing because quite often they, they'll be doing something that you wouldn't necessarily want in your garden, but it's still beneficial to wildlife. Mm. So next door's got a lawn, for example, which is actually good for certain things. The blackbirds feed in it, but we therefore don't need to have a lawn in our garden because that's catered for next door. Mm. So it meant we could do something else. Mm. So that's a really good thing to do as well. Just see yeah. what your neighbours are up to. Spy on your neighbours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't go and talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> just, just get in your window and have a look. Yeah. <laughs> that's your yeah, advice. That's <laughs> What would you recommend in terms of planting in a small garden? 
Well, there's some general rules for all gardens. Okay. So start by knowing your conditions. Yeah. So have you got sandy soil, clay soil, all of that sort of stuff? Is it sunny or shady? And use that to sort of work out what you'd like to, to grow. If you uh, are starting from scratch and you've got completely no idea about plants, then we do recommend the RHS Plant Finder because that, that's really helpful for beginners. You can put in all your conditions, the type of soil you've got, and it will just give you a list of, of good plants. But when you've got that list and you're deciding which ones to go for, there's a few key things you want to be looking out for. So that's nice open flowers, um, flowers that go for a long period of the year, um, things that cover lots of different types of, of plants, so shrubs and, and low, lower down plants, but also climbers to go over the walls as well. Yep. Our motto is plant more plants. If you've got a space, there's usually a plant that will fit it. Like if you, as Ben says, go on this RHS plant finder. But in terms of open flowers, what we mean is not full of frilly petals because quite often pollinators can't access the food within. So yeah, that's a really good tip. We really like shrubs in small gardens, which sounds counterintuitive because obviously they can be quite big, but actually it's been found that you get so much more bang for your buck, if you like. So one shrub you're going to have many, many flowers on, and some of them do flower over a really long period of time as well, and mm. that's absolutely fantastic food source for all sorts of wildlife, as well as being um, shelter for birds and things like that. So think of it as a small tree. That's a really good tip. Yeah, and picking plants that give you more than one season of interest. So for instance, we've got a lot of gardens we look after, and in our own garden as well, we have pyracantha. So it's got a, an open flower. It's good for small, uh, short-tongued insects because they can get into the flower quite easily. But it flowers for a really long time. Um, the leaves are good for, for caterpillars that will eat the leaf. Um, but then also it's got berry later on in the year, which is great for the birds. And the birds absolutely love them. So yeah, that's a really good tip. And things like ivy as well. Again, exactly the same on a wall. The leaves are really good for caterpillars, but it's got a huge amount of flowers. And that flowers really late in the year, which is really important to have flowers all the way from the spring right the way through to the autumn. And because it flowers in sort of September time, that's when most of the other plants you'd get in the garden centre are finished flowering. And it's just buzzing with bees and hoverflies late in the year. It's absolutely beautiful. And then a big blackberry as well, um, which is great for it because the berry lasts right the way through to the spring. And you get things like field fairs come in, the, the winter migrants, and they absolutely love them too. Oh, that's brilliant. So what about if you wanted a little vegetable patch or you wanted to grow some food? Is that possible in a small wildlife garden? Absolutely. We have our little mint of right course. behind you. Of course. Um, currently no beans on it, but there will be beans growing at those bean poles. Yeah, every year we choose a little crop and we don't get masses of food. We can't feed ourselves on it, yeah. but it, what we <laughs> do... Snacks. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. But what we do get, we know it's organically grown because we are organic gardeners. Um, we also know that there's absolutely zero food miles on it. And what is better than stepping out your back door, feeling really twee with a basket in your hand <laughs> and collecting some homegrown veg. Like, I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, and we have loads of herbs as well mm. because we have an allotment separately mm. and uh, we don't want to go all the way up to the allotment just to pick a bit of thyme or whatever. So we have it all here. We've got four or five different types of mint mm. and then we've got marjoram and oregano. We've got thyme, lemon verbena. Uh, yeah, so all of it is within 10 seconds from the door, which is absolutely brilliant. And all of them flower. And a lot of these herbs, especially Mediterranean herbs, and lavender is a great one as well, they have tons of flower and the bees really go nuts for them yeah mm. i suppose that's everything that you've mentioned so far it's anything that's kind of dual or triple purpose yeah. it's yeah. what you know it's something that does a lot of stuff so that's something you can feed yourself feed, feed yourselves the wildlife are going to enjoy it but also with the the stuff that you can't eat if like you're saying long flowering periods all of that kind of thing is that would you say that's the sort of key that people need to Absolutely. keep in mind you've only yeah. got a small space get the most out of it you don't want something that's as you say just sort of flowering for a very short period of time yeah. yeah, sort of pick things that way. Yeah, and definitely. remember to plant in layers. Mm. So we start with bulbs that are low growing. And as they start to die down, you know, as the spring rolls round and the bulbs die down, then the other plants come up mm. and then you've got the shrubs dotted in amongst them as well. Mm. So it's that, that, that variation in height mm. is also really important to allow birds to come in and have somewhere to look around the garden. And because often they'll, they'll be, they'll want to come in somewhere safe mm. and then they'll make sure that it's, it's okay in the garden and then they'll, they'll dip down into the border and, and yeah. go and have a, a rummage around.
perfect. What about people who just have a balcony? Or let's just say they haven't even got a balcony, they've just got, you know, you know they haven't got an outdoor space at all and they want window boxes. In terms of planting, what would you recommend for them? You can do a surprising amount in a planter, for sure. As long as you've got, like, good healthy soil and compost mix in it. I would recommend the herbs personally because they're quite tough, most of them. They can take that extra sun that you might get on a window box. Um, and as Ben said, absolutely fantastic flower resource for all of our pollinators. You can certainly grow tomatoes from a window box if you want a food crop for yourself. And obviously the tomato flowers need to be pollinated and provide another food source for different pollinators. So I don't think it should be seen as a restriction. Mm. Like, I think if, if we did only have a window box, we'd certainly enjoy seeing what we could get away with mm. more than anything. Yeah, and don't forget, you can plant shrubs in pots as well. Mm. You know, if you've got a hanging basket, you can grow um, trailing rosemaries and they flower for ages. And the rosemary is still good for cooking. Um, you can grow things like nasturtiums, which would trail down as well. So, you know, if you've got a hanging basket, you don't have that just that much depth. You can trail things all the way down. But yeah, you can grow anything in a pot that you can grow in the border. So we have lots of um, hydrangeas. We've got salvias as well, which are hugely popular with all sorts of bees and bumblebees especially. Um, so we've got two or different types of salvia here and you can just prune those down. Mm. So at the end of the year, if they get too big, you can just cut them down, keep them to size in the pot. And then next year they just come up with fresh growth. Perfect, that sounds good. What about climbing plants? Because obviously uh, you sort of mentioned about using the most of the all of the space so it's not just the kind of width and depth is it mm. it's also the the height what would you recommend yeah for you, you can actually make a small garden feel bigger with having things going up and over mm. you like certainly when we come out here having this Pfizer carpus next to me really does make the space feel bigger because it's quite a large shrub as you can see mm. but yeah in terms of climbers that's a really really good way of not taking up loads of room in your small garden mm. but still getting that greenery um, so we very much recommend it and behind you there's actually hydrangea simanii which is a good one for shade which we've managed to grow in a pot we'd prefer that one in the ground i think it would be a bit more vigorous but it's mm. it's doing absolutely fine with a bit of feed every couple of weeks yeah. um ben's mentioned the ivy that is an absolute all-rounder as well because it, it self clings which is you know you don't even need to put up wires and things like that yeah. but we'd recommend all sorts of things like yeah don't forget about scent as well because mm. you can grow so many climbing scented plants like honeysuckles yeah. really fantastic for bringing moth into your mm. garden if you bring in the moss you get the bats as well um, we've got clematis here and some of those are scented especially the winter flowering ones mm. and actually clematis are really good for that there are ones that will flower really early in the year January and February when mm. not a lot's out especially for the climbers so they're a good one to try and things like Trachylospermum and jazz, uh, the jasmines as well mm. all of the things that have scent attract insects into your garden mm. and all of them are really easy to keep under control as well so yeah great for a trellis or against a wall they also provide good habitat so it's not don't forget about that as well like we quite often put these almost mini shelves against someone's fence like little ledges of wood which we then allow plants to climb over and then that ledge allows something like a blackbird or a robin or any of the garden birds that will nest on these kind of platforms to make their nest onto it and it's giving you an extra extra layer of habitat so yeah, that works really well. Of course, you've, you've not got a lawn in your garden, but a lot of small gardens are, you know, just a lawn with a, with a fence or a hedge around, aren't they? Yeah. Well, what would you suggest for someone in terms of sort of bringing more wildlife into a, into a garden like that? Well, this is something we've done. We actually put daisy plugs into a small lawn just around the corner for someone that we work with. Um, because, I mean, who doesn't love a daisy? And they're fantastic for pollinators and they look beautiful. We've got some lawns that are just almost all daisy. They stay greener for longer as well. And the only way, uh, all you have to do rather, is to not mow it as often. Mm. Or when you do mow, just to have that mower just a, a couple of centimetres higher than you might do, or than you might think you have to, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's it's so easy, isn't it? Like anyone can do that. Yeah. Any gardening tips that means you have to do less, yeah. I think is always a good thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And for it to then look better as well. Yeah. Um, but we also recommend things like self-heal. Mm. That will also, it can become quite a big plant, but if you're constantly mowing it, it's sort of forced centimetres high or, or maybe five if you can get away with that it will learn to flower at that height which is a really good tip um, yeah. and also clover is another fantastic one as well mm. which a lot of the parasitic wasps enjoy feeding on so mm. do you have some specific recommendations then of, of plants but particularly ones for small gardens yeah start early in the year 
get yourself some bulbs in. Mm. So crocuses are really good and daffodils as well. Mm. And then even if you can't fit them in a border, you can just plant them in a, in a pot mm. and then tuck them away when they're finished. So start with those and then move on to some of the herbs. Like Ellie said, you know, thymes, oreganos and mint. If you allow them all to grow up and flower, really fantastic for wildlife. Mm. On your walls, try and get some ivy on. And uh, you can even have roses as well. Dog roses are native and absolutely fantastic for wildlife. And then in the border, open flowers, um, things like the salvias are really good. Foxgloves, you can get, well, mm. often they come up for free. Um, Veronicastrums and Veronicas, again, really good. Yep, and another thing some people might not realise is that on some plants you get the flower, which is obviously good for the pollinators if it's the right shape. Uh, but also when they go to seed, if they have been pollinated, some birds will take that seed. So that's what we mean when we say make your plants sort of work for your small space. Make, if you pick plants that give lots of different um, interests for wildlife, then mm. that is a really uh, good way of yeah helping local wildlife in your area. Mm. Yeah, so sanguine sorbet. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's what I was looking yeah. for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as an example down here, we've got a meadow crane's bill, which is a native plant, and it's just about to flower. The bees love it, all, all the uh, invertebrates love it, but then in a couple of months it'll go to seed and then greenfinches will come and take the seed from it. So. Yeah, the same is true of sanguis orba, officinalis, and uh, teasel. Really easy teasel. to grow in any garden, yeah. and yeah, goldfinches will come, mm. come and take the seeds. And then you can take that photo that you see all over the place of the goldfinch on the teasel. Yeah, Perfect. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> What suggestions would you have for people who only have a small space to garden in, in terms of making the most of it? I, what I actually enjoy is the challenge of trying to make what I want fit into this space um, and seeing the opportunity that you have rather than thinking of it as a problem. So, for example, this bench behind you, um, we could have just had a void underneath it, but instead we've filled it with logs and bits of wood, and that is effectively the bug hotel that we have in our garden. Mm. And we know it's full of spiders and things because they come out and they bask in the sun. Well, she's sitting there crawling up your legs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but, it, yeah, it doesn't take up any room yeah. in, the, in, in the garden, and, and yet it's a whole habitat mm. underneath. So That's a space that could have easily just been nothing, isn't it, yeah. that you've made? the most of mm -hmm. and what other sort of things have you done like that in your garden where you found a space and you've thought of a use for it um well we've got a lot of things that we need to store in our garden like pots mm. and i think most people do and i actually found an old shelving unit which is for indoor and i popped it on the wall just ne next to the house and that has made a really nice place just to keep things out of the way um, much as you would do in a house, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Shelves outside, why not? Why not? Yeah. Because yeah. I guess not everyone's got a space for a shed or certainly not a garage a lot of no. the time. So having somewhere to put those tools just to make your life easier is a handy thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah, we've got just a, a little table there which doubles up as lots of things. We can store all our compost and things underneath it, but then it's a potting bench, and then it also is just a place to put all the empty pots and storage for when we're not using it. Yeah, multi-purpose again, that's yeah. the yeah. kind of key of this, isn't it? Everything yeah. needs to be multifunctional. Um, I also noticed behind us here, we've got, um, this could have just been a gap here, couldn't mm. it? But you filled it with all of this dead wood. Yeah, Tell yeah. me about that. Um, that was another space that we decided that we couldn't, necessarily put a plant into so we've got the hazel tree in front of it so again we've decided to create another bug hotel if you like and that is just as easy as just putting old logs in and just letting them rot down yeah. and again we've got all kinds of things going on in there so the wildlife doesn't mind that it's next to our cold frame in the corner no, of the garden they're not there for soon no no, no. no. <laughs> um, what else is there i'm thinking about things like hanging baskets or making the use of walls what would you sort of suggest for that kind of thing if you can get a plant in somewhere, then mm. put a plant in somewhere. So Back to that old motto. <laughs> <laughs> it makes things look better as well, but hanging baskets are a really obvious one. And I mean, apart from watering them, they're really easy and you can put a lot of different things in. Um, we love climbers, as we've said before. And of course, if you don't have a garden as well, there's lots of opportunity for window boxes or for hanging baskets. And actually what we've done out the front of our house, which just is straight out onto a pavement, is to use pallets again. And we've made uh, planters outside our house, but we've also persuaded our neighbours to have one. <laughs> and we have put all manner of plants into there. And we know we get moths out there because of it as well, don't we? We, we often have Nicotiana growing, which is night-centred, yeah. and the moths will flock to that. So we know we're, we're creating habitat where 
where before there wasn't much else going on. Yeah. And we hear, because the, the kids walk up to school at the top of the road past the planters, and we hear them talking about the plants every morning. That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That must be so lovely for anybody walking past. I mean, I must admit, when I got here, I was like, that has to be their house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not only have they got it outside their house, they've also encouraged anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be that one. But I don't think people think about that a lot, do they? No. So much. I mean, when you think about your garden, you think about the space you've got out the back. So, of course, if you haven't got a space out the back, then that's just that's that's where you can kind of make a difference, isn't it? Yeah, and definitely. Anywhere you can put a plant is what you're saying. Yeah. Put a plant there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Obviously, there are lots of things that you can do, aren't there, apart from planting. So I'm thinking about artificial habitats and food and water. Um, tell me about some of the ways that you can provide uh, water in a small garden. So the natural thing is just to have a pond in your garden. But because we have a small space, that's a bit more tricky. So well, what we started with was just this bee drinker. And the bee drinker is just some gravel in a pot and then we top it with water and that just gives the chance for the smaller insects to land on a bit of gravel and have a drink because it's really important if it's dry you know there's nowhere else nearby they can go for that um, but then we moved on to a little bird bath and it's just big enough to fit a rock in for the sparrows and for the goldfinches to come down and have a bath but we would like to put a pond in the garden even if it's just a barrel one you know, you can get a, a small barrel and a half barrel, you know, and uh, just line it, put a couple of pond plants in it, fill it up with rainwater, and you'll be amazed what you find in there. So you can do it, but depending on the shape of your garden, you know, if you really don't want a lawn and you really, really want frogs and toads, then why not just, you know, make a little space for a pond because they really don't have to be big to be good for wildlife. Yeah, I've only got a little pond in my garden and I'm already getting quite a lot. It was a, well, it was a lockdown pond, actually. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to know there are options for water. So at the, at the very bare minimum, I guess, if you can get a little bird bath, even if it is just sources of water on the floor is good, isn't yeah. it? And something like yeah. that. That's so easy to do, isn't it? I reckon everybody has, could find room for something like that. What about other kind of habitats, then? So what artificial habitats? I mean, obviously, you can make some of them or you can buy them. But what have you got in your garden? We put up a sparrow nest box. Mm. And sparrows like to nest in groups. And we know we've got sparrows. That's why we did it. Mm. Uh, they haven't used it yet because it went up a bit late this year. But the nest boxes are really fantastic because in nature, a lot of birds would naturally nest in holes in trees. Mm. Now, in this area, as you can see, there's not masses of yeah. uh, holy trees for that to, to happen. So yeah. that's why nest boxes are, are a really good idea yeah mm. definitely and it's, it's also good to get ones that you can get in there and clean at the end of the season so mm. we've bought ours from the rspb because they mm. know what they're doing they do know what they're doing <laughs> yeah <they>? generally <laughs> speaking as well as the nest boxes um we don't have one in our garden because we don't we know we don't have hedgehogs mm. but you can buy hedgehog homes and yeah we've got lots of clients actually that have this and they are used but equally, if you just have a, a shady corner mm -hmm. in your garden that you can just pile up some leaves, hedgehogs will be very happy with that as well. So you don't always have to buy these things. Mm -hmm. um, it's always good to do if you've got kids there, isn't it? To actually have a home yeah. that you can monitor and see where they're That's coming. It. And also uh, bee hotels are another really good thing to have. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, again, mimics nature where there would normally be holes and crevices and again in, in an artificial environment you don't necessarily get that so by putting these things up you're giving more space for nature to move in yeah what would you recommend in terms of positioning for a bee hotel the standard advice is that they like it to be sunny so a south facing wall but actually what we say to people is if you've got multiple bee hotels to pop one in different places and then you can see which ones work best mm. as well and you get a different mix of insects as well that will come and use it. It's not just bees that will nest, you know, you yeah. get lots of different things. Yeah, especially if you get a hotel that has different sized tubes mm. because different species like a different size hole to wriggle into. So yeah, get one with a mixture and then you'll be surprised what you find. Yeah. One thing that I always like in terms of wildlife gardening is anything that you can do for free yeah. and anything that you can do with minimal effort. So I'm, I, I like to have kind of piles of like leaf litter, like you mentioned, yeah. but also, you know, dead wood and things like that. What kind of creatures can things like that attract? All kinds of invertebrates. We actually had a wren was in very interested in our wood pile behind. I don't think it went and nested in it, but you might get something like that yeah. nesting in a, in a wood pile. Yeah, and birds will be looking for centipedes and millipedes. You can even get lesser stag beetles. Um, spiders will live in there. Um, and of course, all the little things are really important. You know, all the little um, wood lice, they've all got their own place in the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah? so they're all 
fantastic to have. Mm. Yeah, it's all about creating as much space and voids and, and building things up in a 3D way. Yeah. I mean, it quite, it's quite hard sometimes for us humans to kind of shrink our, our consciousness down to the level of, an, of some small insect, mm. but having as many holes and nooks and crannies that you don't always disturb are just really, really good for lots of different wildlife. Excellent. So we've talked about places for them to kind of shelter and hide out. Yep. Let's move on to food because that's quite important for all of us, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've got a very impressive bird feeder up here. Thank you. Did you make this yourself? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> very good. What food do you tend to put out for birds? We mix it depending mm. on the time of year. So in the winter we put up fat balls. Mm. Um, but at the moment we've got a, a general seed mix, a dry seed mix, and then we've also got uh, a mix which is better for robins and blackbirds. It mm. includes um, more sort of raisins and, and larger pieces of, um, of nuts and berries uh, for later in the year. But then if you've got goldfinches coming to your garden, you can't go wrong with sunflower hearts and things mm. like that as well. Which yeah. is why we're growing sunflowers. It's for them, yeah. more than us. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, yeah, definitely. The sunflower parts and the fat balls are things that go down quickest in yeah. my garden, definitely. But also They're you really can popular. provide a lot of food with just the right plants. If mm. you choose your plants, to, there's quite a lot of uh, different things that will provide nuts and seeds and mm. fruits and berries for birds. So that's also, that, I think that's always our number one advice, actually. Mm. Give food with plants first and then supplement with things like what you have behind yeah. you. Yes. I guess that's a quick win though, isn't it? Sticking out some bird feeders for someone who's maybe just starting out and mm. if they, they're going to get to see the birds visiting and stuff first, that's kind of a nice way to kind of just, you can do that in an afternoon, can't yeah. you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and of course, instead of buying bird food, you can always put out scraps in your kitchen. So, especially fruit, so apple cores. And if you've got an apple tree, you can just leave them on the ground for the birds to come in as well. Mm. But even things like breadcrumbs and that can go out for them too. Have you got any last minute tips for us then? In terms of wildlife gardening in general or in terms of wildlife gardening in small spaces, what have you got? I think the main one has got to be no pesticides. Boom. Like biggest rule. Yeah. Like as soon as you stop spraying, things can move in, basically. Yeah. <laughs> stop killing everything. Stop killing the yeah. <laughs> so that's a really easy thing for everyone to do, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, we, like we said multiple times, plant more plants, mm. look at the gaps, fill them with greenery and flowers and mm. just just go mad. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I think it can be a bit overwhelming, can't it? I know when I first started my garden, I sort of thought there's so much to do here. I've, I've sort of read so much about it. It's like, how am I going to have the time, the money, you know, the energy to do all of these things? But um it kind of feels like you don't you don't have to do everything at once, do you? Because you've talked about your progress in your own garden, you just add to it. I mean, what, what's your sort of experience of that? Yeah, well, we've been working on this garden for years mm. and we're not finished because a garden's never finished. Yeah. You know, it, it, you keep going all year round and everything changes. Um, you know, plants might work one year and then the next year something's overgrown it and it doesn't work the following year. You know, it's, it's a constant process of evolving mm. and your taste in plants can even change as well over time. You know, you might think that looks beautiful one year, but next year you fancy something else. And so it's, it's it, a lot of it's down to taste and, um, you know, you need to just build the garden up as you go. Because yeah, okay, you can get garden designer in and you can do it from scratch. But actually, if you're starting off, then often you don't even know what you like. You know, so sometimes just being given things from friends, picking things up as you go from cuttings or sowing some things from seed by yourself as well, just gives you a chance to settle into the garden and work out what you like as you go along. Bit of trial and error, I think, sometimes is key, isn't it? That's the way you learn. That's mm. definitely how I've learned from making a lot yeah, of mistakes. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. They say you learn gardening by killing lots of plants, and we've certainly done that over yeah. the years. Even as professional gardeners, that still counts. But never in your customers' gardens, obviously. Never, no, no, no never. <laughs> get, get it right every time. <laughs> I think something that Ben and I would really like to get across is that actually every garden could be good for wildlife and we actually would quite like the idea of every garden being a wildlife garden and maybe you don't even have to be as explicit in calling it a wildlife garden, it just is. We'd That's like to do ourselves out of a job actually. <laughs> if wildlife gardeners never existed that would be fantastic because yeah. I say it's down to, you know, if you want a Mediterranean style garden it can just be fantastic for wildlife, you know, just let the wildlife in and it will come. Thanks so much for chatting with me today. I've learned so much from you and I'm sure everybody has as well. You're, You're welcome. welcome. And uh, if you want to find out more about Ellie and Ben and what they get up to and to get loads of tips, make sure you listen to the Wildlife Garden podcast. 
and of course lots more wildlife gardening tips from us the wildlife garden project so like and subscribe to this video